Welcome to Spry Online for August 15th. I'm Ken Lawyer, one of the pastors at Spry. We're so glad you're joining us. The theme of our worship today is the central message of Jesus, the kingdom of God. Jesus starts his ministry by announcing that the kingdom of God has come near. What does that mean? What difference does it make for you and me right now? How can you and I live in this kingdom that Jesus came to bring? This online service includes a combination of our two musical styles of worship, contemporary and traditional. Worship is at the heart of our vision of seeing individuals and families come alive in Jesus, and we invite you to come pursue Jesus with us. Welcome to worship. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord.
We light candles in worship as reminders of the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're beginning a new sermon series this week entitled, God Did Say That, which is the exact opposite from the series we just finished. God never said that. We're going to spend the next five weeks exploring Jesus' very own words. You know, the words that are found and read in your Bible. Now, five weeks is not nearly enough time to study everything that Jesus said, but we'll look into some of the parables that teach us about the kingdom of God so that we have a clear understanding of his message for us. Today, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, we're going to study the very first words that Jesus taught as he set out on his ministry. Take a look at this picture. Boy, do I love this picture. What great family memories. I bet there are many of you that have a similar picture. I love family pictures, especially when we are on vacation together. This is one of our most memorable vacations as a family. Our trip to Disney World. How many of you have ever been to Disney World? Yeah, my family visited Disney in April of 2009. You can tell by the picture, and it was taken a long time ago, and there are two reasons why. First of all, you can see that Ryan and Sean are both shorter than Michelle. And second, it was so long ago, it was the last time the Phillies actually won the World Series in 2008. You can tell by the matching shirts the boys and I have on. We have a lot of great memories from this trip, but we also learned a valuable parenting lesson on this trip. It was the morning we got up and we were going to visit the animal kingdom. Michelle and I planned the whole day. We knew which rides we were gonna ride, exhibits we were going to visit, and we even knew when we were going to eat and where we were going to eat. What a great day we had planned. What good prepared parents we were, right? Both Ryan and Sean were absolutely miserable all morning, and we could not understand why. They finally told us that they wanted to just go back to the Polynesian Hotel where we were staying and swim in the pool and slide down the volcano slides. Well, how could that be? All these great attractions at Animal Kingdom, and they just wanted to go swimming? Well, we can go swimming back home. Nonsense. They just don't know what good fun is. Good parenting skills, huh? <laughs> Soon after lunch, we decided to stop fighting the boys and just go back and swim in the pool with the volcano slide at our hotel. It turns out that the rest of the day was great. And we had a blast going down the volcano slide time and time again. Lesson learned. Sometimes the best things in life are already right in front of us, already among us. It turns out we didn't even have to leave the hotel to make a lasting memory. Perhaps the most famous kingdom on planet Earth is the Magic Kingdom in Disney World. As my picture says, Disney World, where dreams come true. Now, can you imagine if the whole world was the Magic Kingdom? Now, how fun would that be, right? Endless days of unlimited good food, parades, exciting rides and activities. And if you've ever been there, Disney hospitality is second to none. Not a care in the world. The stress, anxiety, and problems of everyday life are seemingly swept away. The Magic Kingdom wraps you up in a world of make-believe, and it really feels good. 
I know that my family enjoy the experience and there are many people that go back time and time again just to experience all the joys that only the home of Mickey Mouse can provide. However, there be a few problems with a world like that. Most of the world cannot afford it. Even if you have the money to go, to go, once you run out of money, the experience ends. There's a boundary. The magic only happens when you are in the Magic Kingdom. Step off the property and the experience ends. The Magic Kingdom has no king. Now, it does have Mickey Mouse, but he's more of a mascot, not a king. There's a difference. Let me tell you about another kingdom. Unlike the Magic Kingdom, this kingdom is real. Unlike the Magic Kingdom, the cost of this kingdom has been paid in full. Unlike the Magic Kingdom, this kingdom can be experienced anywhere and at any time. There are no boundaries. It comes to you. Unlike the Magic Kingdom, this kingdom is eternal. And unlike the Magic Kingdom, this kingdom has a king. Who is this king? Many people know Jesus as the Son of God. Many people know that Jesus was born on Christmas, died on Good Friday, rose from the dead on Easter, and ascended to heaven 40 days after Easter. Many people have experienced deliverance from guilt, shame, self-destructive attitudes and habits when turning their life over to Jesus. Many people have had a born-again experience. Their hearts, their minds, their personality and perspectives have been totally transformed to a wholesome life. Many people have allowed the Holy Spirit of Jesus to nurture their character, to develop their spiritual gifts, to redirect them from wrong behavior, and to empower them to live a life that is honorable to God and pleasing to the soul. But fewer people acknowledge Jesus as the ruler, the majestic master, the king of all kings. Now, he's not just the king over death, darkness, diseases, and demons. He's the king of the kingdom of God. This is the central theme of Jesus' lessons, stories, miracles, parables, and sermons throughout the New Testament. He doesn't want to just give us deliverance. He wants to be our king. Jesus is the king. Before we dive into the scripture today, I want to give you some background on Mark, the author of the gospel that we're reading. Mark was a traveling partner of Simon Peter, or Peter as we better know him, a disciple of Jesus for about two years before our story is written down. Eventually, they ended up in jail together. Peter sensed that he was soon going to be killed by the Emperor Nero, and before that happened, he wanted to share his account of Jesus' ministry one last time. The reason that Peter was asking Mark to write down his story was because Peter was an uneducated man, a fisherman, and he could not read or write. So Mark wrote these stories down as told to him by Peter, so that generations to come would be able to hear the good news of Jesus, to be told from someone who actually spent time with Jesus. Now, I, I want you to think of our lesson today from the Gospel of Mark, not as just a book of the Bible, and, and I know it is a book of the Bible, but for our purposes today, I want you to think of it as just two men sitting down across from each other, probably in a prison cell. And Peter was telling his story one last time time. This story comes from a man who did not just read this story. He was not just a man repeating a story that he was told. He was a man who actually experienced and saw what Jesus did. Peter was one of the first disciples called by Jesus and is part of today's reading. He was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. That Peter lived and actually broke bread with our king only adds to the credibility of Mark's gospel. Now, we focus on Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20 today, which begins by telling us, After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's take a look at this map. John, or John the Baptist as we know him better, is put into prison down here in the region of Judea a very long walking distance to the Dead Sea. At this part of the Jordan River, John was captured by Herod and put into prison and was beheaded right about here in the southern part of the Jordan River. 
Once this happens, Jesus begins to travel north all the way to the northern banks of the Sea of Galilee. All along the way, he's proclaiming the good news of God. Well, that's nothing we haven't heard before, right? The good news of God. But what is the good news that Jesus is proclaiming? Now, most of us at this point would answer that that good news is that Jesus died for our sins and whoever believes in him will have everlasting life, right? Well, that's got to be the good news. Well, that's good news, of course, but that's not the good news that Jesus is referring to here in our story. We have to get our timeline straight for our story today. At this point of Jesus' ministry, the crucifixion hasn't happened yet. Jesus is very much alive in our story, and he is proclaiming that the good news is here. So what is the good news that Jesus is referring to? Let's look at verse 15 again. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. That and that alone is the good news that Jesus is talking about. If we look at the timing of Jesus' proclamation, we find that this message is sent immediately following his baptism by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a prophet that was foretold to us from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John was sent into the wilderness to do a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now that John the Baptist has completed his job of preparing the way, King Herod Antipas puts him to death. The whole way up the Jordan River, Jesus was preaching, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In other words, Jesus is saying, hello, here I am. I'm the one John was talking about. I'm standing right here, right now. The time has come. I am the good news. The good news of knowing that the kingdom of God is near and is in Jesus requires two things from us. We are to repent and believe the news, the good news. First, that it requires us is to repent. Usually when we hear the word repent, we think of gigantic tents or a town square that somebody's holding up a Bible and yelling into some kind of portable microphone, repent or you will spend eternity burning in the hot flames of hell. In other words, repent and then prepare for the end times. If you don't repent, then you'll be punished. This message is true, but it's usually said in a threatening manner. Jesus is asking us instead to repent by simply turning around or, or turning our minds around or we're going to miss it. Jesus does not want to condemn us through division and separation. He's not threatening us with punishment to believe in Him. He wants to unite us with His message of love through repentance. Again, Jesus is saying, I'm standing right in front of you. I am right here. He's speaking with authority. He is the King, and He wants us to turn in the direction of a brand new kingdom. A kingdom that stands our traditional knowledge of a kingdom upside down. He's talking about a kingdom where the king uses his power and authority to serve the people of his kingdom, not to be served by his people. Matthew 20, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The second requirement is to believe. He simply wants you to submit yourself fully to hear God's kingdom, which is near. The kingdom is near because Jesus is among us. All are welcome here. The invitation is for everyone. Now, one day, Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He started to recruit his disciples. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. 
Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Not too much farther along the shore, Jesus saw James and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Repent and believe. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John are all immediately turned their lives in a new direction because they submitted themselves to the King of Kings who was standing right in front of them. They didn't know who he was at the time, but they followed him anyway because they believed. All of this sounds a little too easy, doesn't it? All Jesus did was simply say, follow me. Boy, Jesus is one great recruiter. I mean, if James Franklin could recruit football players to Penn State like that, we would be saying Ohio State who instead of Ohio State you. Jesus was not recruiting four and five star people to join his team, at least not by society's measure. These four disciples were ordinary people, but Jesus saw something special in them, just like he sees something special in each and every one of us. And just like that, Jesus had four disciples following him, and he probably didn't even have to travel the distance of a football field. Now, that's what happens when you're the king of kings. People want to attend your school. They want to learn more from you. The truth of the matter is, is that perhaps those four disciples had heard about Jesus from others along the shore. Maybe they even heard him preach of the good news. We don't know for sure. What also makes this recruiting class more special is that they came from working class families, from a long line of fishermen. In biblical days, it was the privilege of the wealthy and educated children to get asked to follow a rabbi or teacher and learn from them, not from the uneducated people that could not read or write. People that used their hands to make a living just did not get asked to follow a rabbi. So what did Jesus see in these four men? Did he use personality tests like the Enneagram scale to determine their personalities? Well, I can see Jesus right now. Okay, Peter now is a number six. It makes him very loyal. And I need someone who pairs well with a six, and I need a number nine. And there's James. He's a peacekeeper. Well, the truth is, we'll never know. But Jesus must have been right, because here we are some 2,000 years later, and we're still talking about Jesus and his disciples. Perhaps this is why these four jumped at the chance, because this kingdom is like no other kingdom here on earth. This was an opportunity that they could not pass up. We can use Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John's call to join Jesus as a proof that God's kingdom is for everyone and anyone. God loves us all no matter what our gifts are. We are all equal to Him. We simply need to repent and believe. Yet these four men just left their nets, their fathers, their way of life, and all that they knew and risked everything. No questions asked. At least none that Mark recorded. I don't know about you, but if that were me, and, and I'm being totally honest here, I think that I would have followed that invitation from Jesus with a bunch of questions like, where are we going? How long will we be gone? What's the weather going to be like? Should I pack a toothbrush? When will we be back? Can I call my wife first? I have many, many more of those questions going through my mind, but I probably, but you get the idea. You get the idea. My list of questions center around what I need to know before I commit myself to leaving. If you're like me in this case, we're missing the point of being a disciple of Jesus. That's the hard part for most of us. We're pretty good at staying in our comfort zone and holding on to what we have, but not so good at stepping out of that comfort zone and letting go. More often than not, our spiritual growth involves some kind of letting go. We never get anywhere new as long as we're unwilling to leave where we are. We accept Jesus' invitation to follow, not by holding on, but by letting go. Follow me is both the invitation to and the promise of a new life. So what are the nets that entangle us? Is it an addiction that weighs us down? Perhaps a bad relationship that we feel stuck in? Or maybe we have some behaviors that are having a negative impact in our life. Who are the people from whom we seek identity, value, or approval? Do we have a parent, a spouse, or a boss from whom we are constantly seeking approval? What do we need to let go of and leave behind so that we might follow him? The kingdom of God has come near. 
In Luke 17, it says, Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, from the message, uh, another form of the Bible, the end of that uh, verse in verse 21, it says, because God's kingdom is already among you. It's already among you. Have any of you ever seen this painting? It's a painting called The Light of the World, and it was painted by William Holtman Hunt. In the picture, it shows Jesus knocking on a very old door that looks like it has not been opened in a while. Weeds have grown tall in front of the door and vines have grown on the door. Signs of a door that have not been touched for a long while. If you look closely, you'll notice that there's no doorknob on the door in the painting. There is no door handle on the side of the door where Jesus stands. Yet, there is Jesus knocking on that old door. I like to think of that old door as the entrance to a DIY cell where the walls have been built by the nets, people, and things that we are holding on to because we're afraid to let go. Yet, there's Jesus knocking on the door of the walls built around our heart. Maybe your door is completely closed right now. Maybe your door is open just a crack. It doesn't matter. Jesus won't enter in until he is invited. He is near, on the other side of the door. It is us that needs to turn the doorknob and let Him in. The decision is ours. Letting go of the things that bind us is hard. Just like Simon, Andrew, James, and John in our story today. Once you open that door, you do not know where you're going, how you will get there, or how long you will be gone. Repent and believe. By opening that door, we're letting go of our old lives and letting Jesus, our King, enter our lives. Are you ready to open that door today? The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. And remember, unlike the magic kingdom of Walt Disney World, this kingdom is real. The cost of this kingdom has been paid in full. This kingdom can be experienced anywhere and at any time. This kingdom is eternal, and this kingdom has a king. Repent and believe the good news. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We are humbled by your presence, and we pray that our worship together has been pleasing to you. We recognize that your kingdom has come near to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit is already among us. It is difficult for us to hear your call to us in our lives when we have so many things filling up our minds and our hearts. Help us to listen more closely for you as you stand patiently waiting for us to open the door to our hearts. There are things in our lives that we need to let go of in order to live the life that we have been called to live, a life of service to you and your kingdom. Your kingdom knows no boundaries, has been paid for, is eternal, and is real. Help us to cast our nets to fish for people for the glory of our King, Jesus Christ. To you be all honor, glory, and praise. Amen. Let's continue praying together by reciting the prayer that our King, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let's join together and pronounce what we believe in as a united body of Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Each week in worship, we share about how people are alive at Spry to highlight what God is doing in us and through us. Our church partners with a number of organizations to serve Christ in our community and world. One of these organizations is called Servants. This summer, a team of youth and adults from our church participated in the Home Helps work camps. Along with hundreds of volunteers of all ages, they gave of their time to work on home repair projects for over 50 homeowners in need throughout our area. One homeowner who had lost hope completely was encouraged by her neighbor to find the courage to reach out for help and open her home to volunteers from servants. These volunteers remodeled her kitchen and bathroom, making her home safe and habitable again. In her moving testimony at the end of the work camp week, she said, I opened my home to God again after many years. I feel hopeful again. Thanks to your generosity, we play a part in this life-changing work, God's work, in us and through us, bringing people hope. Thank you. Now we invite you to respond to God's love through your giving. You can give online, by mail, or by text using the instructions on your screen. Join Jesus in His mission of changing lives and join us as we offer our gifts and our lives to God in worship.
Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you're new to Spry, please fill out a connection card at sprychurch.com connection. If you leave your contact information, we'll be glad to send you church updates, answer your questions, and connect with you. At Spry Church, you're invited to come pursue Jesus with us. Here's a few ways you can be involved. Join us for a free family movie outdoors on the big screen, Friday, August 20th at 7.30 with free snacks and drinks. Bring your family and chair or blankets for a fun movie, Raya and the Last Dragon. On Sunday, August 22nd, join us in worship as we pray for students, parents, and educators from our community. In each worship service, we'll have a time of prayer for students and their parents, classmates, teachers, and administrators and staff. All children, youth, and educators are welcome to participate. Kids are encouraged to bring their backpacks to be blessed that day. Students of all ages and all involved in education will receive something special to remind them God is always with them. The past year and a half has been a really tough stretch. There's been a lot of loss and a lot of grief. A number of people in our church and community have experienced loss. On September 14th, we'll be starting a Grief Share group. Grief Share is a faith-based, nationally recognized program to help people cope with their grief and loss. It's a grief recovery support group where you can find help and healing for the hurt of losing a loved one. The meetings will be once a week running from 6.30 to 8 p.m. In this group, people can share as much or as little as they want. Everything is held in confidence. There is a program workbook. The cost of this workbook is $10. People from our church as well as our wider community are welcome to participate. If you think this experience would be helpful for you or someone you know, please sign up by contacting our Director of Congregational Care, Linda Reed. If you have any questions, please contact Linda. Now the blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen.